Welcome to another episode of the Starter Girls Podcast with your host, Jennifer Loading and Brianna Drellis. And together we are the Starter Girls, where extraordinary decisions produce extraordinary results. These are our friends, these are your friends, and they are living extraordinary. Today's episode is brought to you by Walt Mills, photographer of Glad Models Agency. If you are here in the Dallas or surrounding area and looking for some photography work, check out Walt Mills. You can learn more about him at photosbywalt.com. Head over to startergirls.com and also pick up your freebie from us. We want to keep in touch with you and uh, see how we can help you up level those decision-making skills. So head over to startergirls.com and grab that today. All right. We're ready to get started. Let's go. All right. Today is a great day to be brave. You might as well start now. You have the power to change your circumstances any day you decide. Let today be that day. Rise up. Be amazing. Be you. Do you. We haven't said that in a while. I know. It's been a while. I wrote it out. I wrote it out in an email last week. Did you? Awesome. (laughs) Fun. All right. Well, my friends, we are super excited to welcome our guest to the show today. And I'm excited because it's been a while since we've been recording. So I'm just excited to get to read a bio today. Like, I love reading (laughs) bios. So this is so much fun. Gina Schaefer is the founder and CEO of a few cool hardware stores. Gina's big passion is for developing urban markets, supporting small businesses, and helping women to succeed in all aspects of the hardware industry. A self-proclaimed localist, Gina has tirelessly focused on the return to Main Street movement in the district to promote shop local campaigns and community revitalization in urban areas. She and her husband are members of the Ace Hardware Cooperative and own and operate 13 hardware stores in D.C., Baltimore, Alexandria, Virginia, and Montgomery County. Gina Gina has received numerous accolades for her many accomplishments, including recipient of the Women Who Mean Business Award from the Washington Bureau Journal, 2009, recognized as an industry top gun in 2011 by the National Retail Hardware Association, honored by Profiles in Diversity, one of its Women Worth Watching in 2013, and recognized by Hardware and Building Supply Dealer as one of 14 of the 2016 People of the Year. Impressive, Gina. I love it. Yes, and bless you. <laughs> Thank she you. Also Thanks. serves on the corporate board of CCA Global and the nonprofit board of the Institute for Local Self Reliance. When her busy schedule schedule allows, Gina loves to relax by making greeting cards. She's also a big believer in the power of the written note. I am too. She likes kayaking, taking spin classes, traveling, reading, and of course mentoring other small business owners. You just have a, an amazing full schedule. I love it. Sounds like it. Who is that woman? <laughs> That's right. So welcome to the show, Gina. We're excited to have you here. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. And I love your intro, like the enthusiasm and the phrasing and everything is so cool. (laughs) Hey, I get to do this part. It's my favorite part of the podcast is reading bios. Like I'm like, if I do nothing else in life, I'm just going to read your bio and have fun with it. You know? Okay. (laughs) It's like her secret gift or they say like, what is your uh, hidden talent? Jennifer's hidden talent is reading bios. Yeah. Sure. You actually on? read it like you knew it. Like a lot of people don't do it fluidly. And it's a little embarrassing to sit here and like listen to someone talk about you, especially if they get it wrong or they're oh. like, yeah. and like, you just did a great, you did, you did me proud. Thank you, Gina. <laughs> Thank you. I feel so good today. You made my day. I love it. I love it. Who would have thought when I was a little kid, we would have said, Hey, Jennifer's going to grow up and she's going to read bios. <laughs> right. That's right. It's all good. It's fun. I have fun. Well, welcome to the show. We're super thrilled to have you here today and get to, to know you, you a little bit better and um, hear all, all the great things that you are doing. So we're excited. Thank you. So I guess what I want to do, and I know Brianna's going to have some questions too, I'm sure, as this goes along. We're Like I said, we're, it's our first day back in studio, so we're like getting our, you know, our bearings our in place. Our sea legs back. Yeah, exactly. Getting our sea legs. But I want to start off a little bit, I guess, Gina, walk us back through this, how this came about. How did you get 13 Ace Hardware stores? Tell us how this came about for you. So I, I was actually just writing a snippet about this for something else. In 2000 and two, I got laid off from my job. It was the third time I had gotten laid off from a tech job in three years. And so um, I lived in a neighborhood that had been destroyed by the riots when Martin Luther King was assassinated. And people were moving back into this neighborhood, myself, one of those people, because it was an inexpensive place to live. And there were beautiful old houses that just needed love. And there was an empty retail street that just needed inspiration. And I got laid off and I came home from work one day and my husband's name is Mark. And I said, Mark, I am not commuting anymore, and I'm not going to work for a man anymore, which is no offense to men. My boss at the time was a man, so I held everything against him. Um, I said, I'm going to open a hardware store. And I mean, the rest is sort of history. I opened that first store um, 
in 2003, March of 2003. And after two years, I started opening one a year. People were so excited in Washington to have a hardware store in their neighborhood. They were knocking on my door. They were sending letters, calling. Um, and there were lots of really great opportunities for growing. So I was there at the right time. Incredible. How did you choose hardware of all the things, all the little, not little, but all the businesses that you could start? Did you have a, did you grow up loving tools? Like what? No. In fact, I, I tease my dad all the time because he never taught me how to use anything. And my dad is so proud. Like he thinks it's so cool to say that he has a kid that owns hardware stores. But I never learned how to use any of that stuff. Um, it was truly knowing what the neighborhood needed. I had always wanted to own my own business. Um, I used to joke that if I wrote a book, I would call it from software to hardware because I was in the technology industry. And it was the biotech industry that, that laid me off last. And it was physical security. So like our fingerprints for to get you indoors and things that have become fairly common. But this was, you know, 18 or 19 years ago. So it was very... Um, sort of fluffy at the time. It was all unproven. And I wanted something really practical. And I lived in this neighborhood that had a ton of boarded up houses, lots of people moving back in. There were almost no businesses here. Um, and I just, I mean, I'd like to think that it was like this fantastic idea that hit me over the head one day. I don't know if it was quite that easy. Um, I did explore some other opportunities, but it, it was hardware and that was it. Like the neighborhood loved the idea and it just worked. Wow. That's yeah. unbelievable. I love how you saw the need and you created the solution for it. I mean, that's like the, yeah. that's the whole like magic formula for successful businesses is like answering the need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I never yeah, thought I'd own a hardware store. So cool. <laughs> love that. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting I'm, as I'm, she's talking about this, I'm thinking about like just people that have come into my life recently that had these like careers like I, I have a friend that went to pre-med school and she's now working for a roofing company also worked did plumbing and she'll probably hear this podcast and know who I'm talking about but she wants to get into the real estate market and so her whole background or you know going from pre-med into these other areas is that she wants to learn everything she can about this market this niche and how do you get better at that learn all the aspects of home buying and having a home and all of that and then I ran into another person that had, you know, a background, here we go again, into account, in accounting. <laughs> it's like the number one thing. What did you used to do? I was an accountant. Um, I was an attorney. He, yeah, exa exactly. But he opened up an air conditioning building and he said, I make more money doing that because there is a need for that, you know? Sure. So I think, yeah, it's the finding in the community what people need and then fitting that niche and you did that yeah you know? this is logan circle is just, it's a really special place that's the name of the neighborhood that i first opened in um it's it's beautiful and historic and had been really just forlorn for so long and so it was really cool to be here um at the beginning of the rebirth i mean it had it had a heyday prior to the um the 60s and so it that beauty was there it had just gone dormant and so it was really cool to be part of that, the revitalization. I mean, people needed hammers and nails and picture hangers and paint and they had to get it somewhere. And we were driving to the suburbs and I was tired of driving and I didn't think we should have to leave the city to spend our money um, to fix these houses up. So it just worked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had a question and then I just totally lost it, but I like this, a few cool hardware stores. I think this is so cute. Is this like, do you, is this like how you label these or did we just come up with this? Like really, is there like something behind this? Yeah, so it's kind of, I mean, you know, so many things happen happen on accident. I'm so embarrassed at how dirty it is. You are fine. Head. We don't even care. I'm we so don't sorry. even care. Hey, Gina, if you my note from my dad is this. Your, my note from my dad is from to the cute CEO. It's free. It's so cute. Oh, anyway, I love it. Sorry. I love it. No, that is so cute. I named all of the stores. We name all the stores after the community they're in. So uh, the store where my office is, which is the original store, is in Logan Circle. So it's called Logan Hardware. Our next store was in Glover Park near Georgetown University. It's called Glover Park Hardware. So we we were adding all of these stores and we didn't have an overarching name. And my email signature was getting longer. And I, I also thought it was a little cocky to say, I'm the owner of Logan Hardware, then Glover Park Hardware. And then the third store was Tenley Town Ace Hardware, which is like 85 letters, right? I was like, my email signature is going to be way too long. And so on a whim one day, I said, owner of a few cool hardware stores. And three is a few. I never obviously thought ahead to where I would have seven or eight or 13 stores. 
um, or I might have rethought that, but it stuck. It resonated with the employees. It resonated with the customers. Um, and so now we're a few cool hardware stores. I love it. It's it's like yeah. your own little, like, kind of like your own little trademark. I like it. It's just, it's, yeah. you know, it's yeah. kind of like we talk about in business about being a unicorn, right? Because anybody can walk up and be like, hey, this is what I do. You know, I'm a coach or I do this or I'm the owner of this. But when you say, you know, I'm the founder and CEO of a few cool hardware stores, people are like, what does that Who's mean? That? It's a conversation starter. You know what I'm saying? Yes. I love it. Thank that's you. why I asked that because it caught my attention. I'm like, that's pretty like clever. I like it. It's fun. Yeah, it's fun. Well, I'm kind of curious about the the greeting card situation. So when, <laughs> when you're not when you're not busy with these 13 stores, you like to make greeting cards. Well, so when I was, right? you, yeah, yeah, you did. You caught it right. You know, everyone should have a hobby, right? Yeah, Someday it. I'm going to retire. Um, I started a very interesting succession plan last week, so hopefully we can get to that. But in 2003, uh, the joke in my family is that my husband was watching too much TV and I was bored, so I needed a hobby. And so one day I said, I'm going to make a greeting card because I was constantly buying cards to send people thank you notes, birthday, whatever. Um, and so it just, it really grew into a hobby that now has caused me to spend thousands of dollars on craft supplies. You, do you get like a little, <laughs> like, you know, Everything. Vellum and the little flowers. Uh, yes. and they're, the... They're, I'm guessing they're gorgeous. Oh, I bet. <laughs> Do you use they're, glitter? They're, they're all unique. I actually, glitter. glitter's the one thing. Funny that you said that. Glitter's the one thing that I don't like to use. It's kind of hard, right? Um, it's, messy. it's hard. It makes a mess. Um, it's in your but hair. particularly during COVID, I went down this rabbit hole of Instagram videos and I have met. Um, <laughs> makers and sellers of craft products all over the world whose videos I've watched and learned from. So every time I watch a new one and they use a new supply, I'm like, well, I need that. Right. So I've got all that kinds of stuff. So fun. I love it. Yeah. yeah and it's I fun. do agree. That I do you think need... Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was yep, just going to say, I do agree with you a hundred percent on you need to have something fun. You have to have a, a yes. another outlet. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good balance to having to be you know, I'm not the numbers person in the business, but as a CEO, you really have to look at reports and be regimented and, and think about things in a more linear way than somebody like me often does. And so the greeting card um, hobby allows me to do, you know, use the other side of my brain when I get home. So it's nice. That is great. I love it. Okay. So I do, I do have a question for you back to this, this business, because obviously you've got 13 stores. There is some kind of success pattern there. So for somebody who is maybe either looking to start a business and, and a lot of, and, I, and I'm gathering that you're probably a visionary. I'm, I'm gathering some of this in here by listening to you. you have to be in order to be able to see that. And a lot of times we talk about, we don't really know the hows. We just kind of see the big picture where we're going. And sometimes we don't even see far enough yet to know, but we kind of see that big picture. What I would like to know is if somebody was starting out something maybe share something that you feel like is important in, in success because clearly you've done something right here. Um, you know, I, I'm working with an editor on this book that I'm writing and she loves to remind me, I think constantly that hindsight is always so much easier. Um, and so I can say all of these things that I did or wish I had, had done, but I think I know that now, right? So this only feeds into my piece of advice to say that None of us know exactly how to do what we want to do when it's time to do it. Most of us, anyway, when we start a business. You know, you might have a passion for creating floral arrangements and you want to open a florist. Um, but you don't know, how, you might know how to make floral arrangements, but you don't know anything about running a business. I, I was never afraid to ask a million questions. I didn't care. To me, there was no such thing as a dumb question. There was only something that would make me a better business owner. And I think a lot of people get mired. They either don't start because they're afraid they don't know enough. Or once they do start, they feel like they need to know it all and they don't ask all of the questions. I was in a really, you know, sort of a funny situation, but I sell, I don't know, about 25,000 products in my stores. Well, I don't know about you ladies, but I don't know what two products are that you use to fix things or I didn't then. Um, so I had to ask a lot of questions, just the nuts and bolts department I had. So the, you know, the vendor would come in and I would say, sit down, <laughs> you're not going to leave until you tell me what these five screws do and these three washers do or, you know, whatever. Um, so the, the biggest advice that I typically tell small business owners is you probably don't know it all. So don't pretend that you know it all. Yeah. 
I would agree with you on that. I think it takes a certain amount of, I guess, vulnerability, but also confidence to be able to say, one, I'm not going to know any, I'm not going to know it all. And I'm going to have to learn and be okay with that. But then also same way, be okay that, Hey, I don't know. And I'm confident enough to step back and say, I don't have the answer to that. Let me find out. I think you said something that really caught my attention too. that. Just the asking questions. I think that people that truly want to learn. And I, and I was thinking about Brianna. I, I was just thinking about you on the questions, totally thinking about Brianna. Um, because when you're asking questions to me, I feel like if you really want to know something bad enough, you're going to do that. You're going to, you're going to take that on and say, I'm going to find out the answers that I need to know, even if I don't have all the information right now. Yep. Yeah, it's true. I liked your confidence and vulnerability. I've never framed it that way, but that's a really nice way to a really nice way to think about it. We have uh, several core values that we govern ourselves by, and one of them is always grow and share. So the second thing that I think I, I learned or at least tried to do pretty early on is realize that I couldn't do it all. I needed to have people around me that uh, could do things that I either didn't like to do or didn't want to do, didn't know how to do. And that ended up leading to this culture of, of trust and teaching other people and you know, a good boss makes themselves obsolete. Um, people ask me how we've grown over the years so quickly. And that's because I have a team that I trust to do their jobs. And, and that's made a big difference. If I, I'm completely incapable of micromanaging, but if I wanted to, or if I was that kind of person, it would also be really challenging uh, to open lots of locations. And, you know, 13 is a lot for me, you know, big box stores wouldn't call it a lot, but um you know, we're small. And so it's, it's, it straps the resources and, and can be challenging. So I have to trust the team to do their job. That's incredible. Oh yeah. I love it. So awesome. Well, and the, the thing there, you know, cause I just got through reading this book and they were taught, they're talking about like the five dysfunctions of a team and, and what they were talking about in there. I think it was in this book or I don't know, one of them I was reading, but they were talking about how a lot of times, you know, executives don't want to hire somebody better than them because they want to control and mm. control everything, right? Well, then they never grow. They never get outside of that where they are because there's nobody better than them doing what they can do. And so you yep. kind of said that when you were trusting people to do their jobs, it's when you can learn to delegate and say, hey, I'm going to find that person that's really good at doing this because maybe this isn't an area that I truly enjoy. I'm the first to admit that. I have lots of things I do not enjoy. I do not want to do them, right? I will gladly no. let somebody do them for me, you know, but finding that right person and trusting them and letting them go do their job. I think that's great. Yeah. Amazing. It makes your life easier. It makes their life more fulfilling. It's, I mean, I've grown bigger leaders because I've let them do things and make mistakes and learn sort of along with me. I have a lot of things outside of the business that I like to do, and I would have never been able to do them, like make the cards or give speeches or do podcasts or all of the things that I've had a chance to do if I was stuck inside the four walls. That's right. Um, yeah. And probably, you probably wouldn't have grown either. Like you probably wouldn't have expanded in the way that you did or scaled in the way that you did because you were, you're going to be so busy doing all the meticulous things in the one, the one store. You know, yeah. this reminds yeah. me also of the book E-Myth, which talks yes. about, right? So, you know, yes. in E-Myth, they're talking about how it's so important that as the boss, as the owner, you do the vision, the vision work, but you can't do the vision work if you're doing the busy work of yes. the worker, right? right? Yes. So you right. have, to, you have right. to allow the worker to do their job. Uh, and then you have to step into that role as, as the visionary. So 100%. Really cool. The other thing that I really... Sorry. Uh, the other thing that I really like about that book is that uh, people often say, like, how did you know, how do you know what kind of business to start? Or did you know anything about hardware? And at this point, it's clear to me that if you know how to run any business, you know how to run any business. So all businesses have HR, we have finance, we have marketing, uh, we, you know, some sort of inventory or supply chain, you know, whatever. You can do that as a pie maker, as a hardware store owner, as a boutique owner, as a daycare center owner, as a, I helped a woman start a medical practice once years and years ago. Well, I didn't need to know anything about being a doctor. I needed to know how to hire people and put files together and set up, you know. So that's one of the things that I really took from the EMF too, is learn the basics and then hand off the, the technical parts to people who really excel at them. Absolutely. And, and trusting yeah. that they can do their job. Yeah, you know, releasing, for sure. Releasing that control. 
Yeah. Because it only hinders your progress when you're like meddling in every single department. My husband calls it job security. Like every once in a while, we'll have someone on my team and we recognize that. And he'll say, you know, they're not teaching anybody how to do it because they think that that means they'll lose their job. But that's so wrong. I mean, if you're in a really healthy work environment like we've created, that means you get more opportunity. You get to do something else that's cool because you've taught somebody to do your job really well. Um, so it's not job security. It's more of a hindrance, I think. It's like scarcity there, mi- it's yes, scarcity mindset. Yes, there's the moment. That's yeah. the moment, Gina, right there. Yes, that's the moment. Like, like every podcast we do, there's like that moment where somebody says something. I'm like, that's the nugget right there. The nugget. Oh, and I was cool. thinking scarcity yes, mindset. Scarcity yes. mindset. Because like, we no, do. No, there's not enough. Exactly. There's not enough of, you know, I'll get laid off. And so oh, I have to hold yep, on to it. I yep. have to squeeze it. <laughs> Yeah. And that's a hard thing for a lot of people to really learn to, to master that whole getting out of that space of, you know, I can't share my ideas or I can't teach somebody what I know or whatever that is. I mean, I, I, I'm the first to admit that I used to think like that. I really did. And then when I started really working on me and I know it's a weird thing, isn't it? It's kind of like me saying I used to be shy. People never, (laughs) no way. Be like, that did never happen. Yes, it did. But yes, it, a lot of people are stuck in that. And it's hard to move past that and get into that. Yeah. The more you give, the more you're going to get in return. And so this is so awesome. So where it's, do you see this going? Like where, what's the, you said something earlier about some plan or something. Succession. So tell, succession yeah. Tell us plan. something about this succession plan. We invite yeah. So you. I've we had, invite yes. you to share. share. I have had the coolest week of my entire life, ladies. So, Ooh. um, People, people started asking us years ago what our exit strategy was. And I thought, well, God, you know, I'm, I'm running this new business. I'm not going to talk about leaving it already. Uh, but at some point, we realized we had to figure out what we were going to do. And I don't have any children. So hardware is very generational. So I didn't have any kids to leave the business to. Um, and so Mark and I decided about a year and a half ago or so that we were going to form an employee stock ownership program, an ESOP, and we were going to sell the business to our employees. Um, it took us probably about a year and a half to become educated ourselves and then to set it up. And so last week we finally got to tell our team that they are now owners of 30% of the business, which is oh, so, it's been huge chills. So I did excited. Too. Yeah. That is wow. So amazing. They yeah. must've been, were they just peeing in their pants? I have to know. Like <laughs> they were like, so, what? It's, no, it's, it's really funny. So we, we were on our way. We did it in Baltimore. We, well, we first, we told the 38 leaders. And then the next day we went, we, we called it um, your piece of the pie. So the next day we went to all the stores and we took pie and handed it out with buttons that say employee owned. I wish I had one right here, but oh my um, God. so there were a lot of blank faces at first. My, I back up for a second. On the way to tell everybody, Mark and I made a list. Who do we think is going to be excited? Who do we think is going to have no idea? Who do we think is going to be like, oh my gosh, this is awful. Like whatever. You know, 38 people, it's going to run the emotions. And everyone fell in line. They did exactly what we thought they were going to do. Um, but it's a very complicated concept to understand in ESOP, unless you've already worked with one or you've studied one for some reason. So um, I announced it. I think I told the team that based on the, look on the looks on their faces that they were glad I wasn't saying that we were dying or just leaving that day, right? We could have been like, we sold you. Hello, we're going somewhere else. Um <laughs> So people were excited about that. And then we started an educational process immediately. So we answered some of the key questions that day and then celebrated. And then over the last week, we've done videos and newsletters and um, meetings, which will be ongoing until we can explain it to everybody. Sure. Particularly. Yeah. So, so fun. So fun. I love it. That's amazing. I got chills listening to that. That is so incredible. Thank you. Good stuff, Gina. Yeah. Well, that's, I feel like that is the best case scenario for, you know, a lot of these employees, because at the end of the day, they, they probably love, like at this point, if they're invested with you, they, they love their work, they love their job. They don't want some random person to come in and, and like sell it or get rid of it or change everything or, you know, whatever. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, we couldn't think of a better way to so exit is so final, right? What's your exit right. strategy? I was joking. It's like someone saying, see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. Um, I wanted to think of it as the next chapter. And who better to lead the next chapter than the person who helped us build the first chapter? And that's exactly what, I mean, retail is a tough job. It's, I've worked for years to have the federal minimum wage pay way raised. We, we, we pay well in D.C., but it is not good enough for as expensive as the city is. And I realize that. And so we've always encouraged everyone to learn some great skills 
and go where they can have a bigger career. Not everybody wants to do that. People want to stay because they like working here. And I want them to have a comfortable job and figure out a way to make it a comfortable place to live and retire. And part of that is your hourly wage or your salary if you're on the leadership team. But part of that is also what you're building for the future. So in addition to the 401k and profit sharing that we already had, they now own the company 30% and eventually it will be 100%. So as long as the company continues to do well, they're building long-term wealth for themselves as cashiers and delivery drivers and key cutters and paint makers. And that's really, really cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I'm, and, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm hearing kind of this culture that you've sort of created within that. That's kind of what I'm thinking when you're talking about this, because I feel like a lot of times people don't always stay in positions just for salary. It's a lot about the culture and what they're creating in the long-term yeah. picture. So I feel like that's, you're kind of covering yeah. all that in there. Hence why they yeah. don't want to leave. And I think that's remarkable. Yeah. I think, it, yeah, I just think it's remarkable to it's find community that. building as well. Mm -hmm. like, Thank you. And then the long-term contribution, because yeah. you are, you're giving these people an opportunity to um, like have that equity and, and have that long-term, it's like long-term security. It's not just, right. you know, that's today. it. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it is so, it's so, um, if you think about, just, you know, the climate in the world today and gender equity and racial equity and um, generational wealth and all of the things that are being talked about in the news. Mark and I continue to have conversations about how can we, even if it's just a tiny piece, like how can we affect change in all of these conversations? And one of the, one of the answers was we make the employees the owner of, owners of this business. And so... Um, there's about, I think, 7,000 ESOPs in the country, about 14 million employees. I should know that right like the back of my hand at this point. Um, so there aren't that many in the grand scheme of things. And so it's, it's fairly um, untalked about. But there's lots of benefits to being uh, creating an ESOP, both for the company and the employees and so or owners. Um, so hopefully more people will hear me talk about it, at least in the D.C. region, and, and consider it. Wow. Yeah. Change it. I love it. Change in what do we call it? trajectory of people's lives. I love it. How do you, how do you uh, help impact the community? I love this. All the stuff you're talking about, just how do you, those conversations you. you were talking about and how you play can play a role in that. So, and she's doing it in a great way that they're, they're having the ability now to have some kind of ownership and, and be able to really changed their lives. I love it. I don't even have anything more to yeah. say. It's like a mic drop. It's all good, Gina. I love it. I'm like, my, brain, my brain's trying to like formulate all of this. I'm like, it, gosh, if so many com businesses operated from this model, you know, it's not just, hey, we're handing you something on a silver platter. No, we want you to stay here because we value you and we want you to be a part of our community. And here's what we're going to give you in return. And you're going to know you're going to get to be a part of this. I, I love that all of that component well it's just the yeah and then and the ownership piece for them yeah. yes. they take pride in and their and what they're doing because it's it's theirs typically esops grow at a faster stronger rate than non-employee owned businesses based on a lot of the studies that i've read and the statistics that i've seen so we're hoping that happens with us i mean they don't the 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 employee owners can now if the business doesn't do well they don't make any money from it and if the business doesn't do well, they can't buy out more of my percentage. So typically, th this kind of exit happens in three tranches. And so 30%, 19%, and then the final 51 when I no longer have any control at all. Um, but the business has to do well for that to happen. And it. so that's my goal. And I will be here to help them start that transition. Um, and they know now that that's their goal as well. So that's so awesome. That's so yeah. awesome. Good stuff, Gina. So good. Well, I, think I should ask her a few fun questions. I think this has been so good. Don't you think? Absolutely. I got a, I got a, I got Amazing. a question because we talked a lot about books today. We've been on like a book thing today. So apparently all of us read. We, well, I know Brianna and I do. Okay. It sounds like you do, I don't, Gina. I don't really read. I just pretend that she, I do. She, she listens to audio. I have to sit down with my paper so I can earmark pages and highlight oh, things. Oh, I love all that too. Yeah. I just, you know. I'm like, I'm reading, right now I'm reading a book called Spin Selling. How to be a better seller. I'm learning some new. I've been selling for years, but this is like a like some stuff that I kind of been doing that I never really. You know how they put term they put like titles for things like you've been doing things and you're like, whoa, I didn't know that that was what that was called, right? 
But yeah, did you know, I'm writing some, that down. Yeah, there's some differences between large, how you do large sales and small sales, the way you approach those. And so mm-hmm. I never thought of it like that. So I'm learning some stuff. But anyways, what I wanted to ask you, Gina, is there any particular book that you will say was maybe like one that you really remember as being a really like something powerful for you? Good book, powerful for you. Oh my gosh. I feel like I needed to be prepared for this question. Oh, sorry. Well, what's one uh, that comes to mind if, if I ask you like... Well, so I am writing a memoir. So I have been a voracious reader of memoir over the last year and I've always loved it. But I've read two recently that made a big impact. Uh, one was called Punch Me Up to the Gods. I'm from Ohio and it was written by a man from Ohio. Um, and it was sort of his story of getting out of a small town. Um, and I really loved that. And then I read another one called Between Two Kingdoms that was so incredibly well written, I may never finish mine because there's no way anything could compare. I mean, it was just beautiful. So I think just how to deal with life. And the, the author was sick for a long time and it was just the grace that she lived with and how she verbalized, you know, how ticked off she was and how mad it made her, but how, how to help people. And anyway, it was, yeah. Sorry, I don't have a business book to give you. I haven't read no, one in a while. No, that's good. No, no, no. We collect, yeah. we collect book titles, so it's helpful. It's okay. Like, you know, when I get Those are both book, really I'm like, good. reading what next so I can figure out what I want to read. So that's yeah. good to know. Yeah. It's good to know. Okay. Well, I would love to know, since you're in the D.C. area, what your favorite, um, like, touristy place mm. to go to would be in the D.C. area, right? Because there's obviously a lot of tourism there. So... There's a lot of tourism. Yeah. yeah. But like um, a place that like, you know, you don't mind going to because it's pretty stinking cool, even though there's a ton of tourists there. Um, gosh, there's so many. Okay. So three places. The National Portrait Gallery at 9th and F Street is stunning. It's got the most beautiful atrium. It was millions of dollars to renovate. It's a really old building. And it's a little known secret. I've actually, I don't feel like I've been there when there have been absurd amounts of tourists, but it's beautiful. Um, the National Botanical Garden is blocks from the Capitol, and it is just an oasis in the middle of the city. So that one's very awesome. And then Eastern Market is a flea market and really, really old sort of grocery market near Capitol Hill. Uh, that's just uh, you. It, it's just a fun place to walk through every weekend. You know, farmers come and park there, which is a little unusual for the city. I mean, we have farmer farmers markets, but. Um, you know, people take their kids and let them run around the fountains and walk their dogs. And it's just a little special piece of DC that a lot of people don't know about. So I could name a lot of things, but those three are probably my favorite. All so right. now we know what to do. We I go know. to DC. We, got, we see yes. my kids. We got so. books and we got tourist lists. To Love see. it. There you go. <laughs> this is so I'm good. excited. Gina, so when is your memoir coming out? What's the plan date on this? Well, uh, probably in the spring. That's what I'm guessing. It's going to be this, it's going to be the spring at this point. Um, I think I'm, I have a, depending on if you ask my editor or myself, a good rough draft of the entire book. She thinks about half of it is done. So, yeah. You got it. Yeah. We, both, we both have done books, so we get it. We understand that. Oh, you have. Yeah. Do you know. Yeah. I'll we take any it. advice you want to give me. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> give her some re- good advice. <laughs> re- reach, out to, reach out to me because yeah. I have a lot. I actually uh, literally um, just coached two different people on their books. But aside from that, I, I love helping with book launches. So if you okay. have any questions about book launches, then holler at me. I, I definitely uh, have some advice yeah, in that department. Okay. Brianna's the rock Thank star you. in that. It's definitely a process. You know, it's, I tell a funny story. I don't, I'm sure, I think I shared this with Brianna, but I talked about writing a book for like almost a year and people, I kept going like to networking places and people would ask me like, when are you going to start the book? Kind of like I just did you or when are you going to finish? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Cause the hardest part for me, again, go back to like the outlining and visionary. I could see the end result. I, it was the outlining that was hard for me, that, that bottom line, right? Like how yeah. do I piece yeah. it out? So finally one day I walked into this office to meet a potential client and I remember him saying something to me. We were talking about Instagram and Facebook and he's like, and you need to get your book out. And so I just, I walked out of that place, got in my car, picked up my Facebook and I put a post on it and said, okay, I decided I'm going to write the book. And, and I just made that commitment because I knew that if I put yep. that out there, I was gonna, people, yep. people were going to ask me for real and I was going to be held accountable because I didn't want to come back and be like, well, that didn't happen, you know? So it, it did. I got it done. I think that was in May. And I 
ended up putting it out in October of that year. I just, I start, ironically, Gina, people started coming into my life all of a sudden. People that, you know, editors and publishers and, yeah. and Brianna came in shortly after yeah. I launched the book. And so it was like, people just kind That's of- That's so more. cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. But she, Jennifer is spot on on that. You, it's like, you have to kind of put it out there. Uh, this book is coming. Yeah. It's happening. And then all of I'm the ready. I love, love to talk about make stuff. this happen. Yeah. 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 It's great. I, my husband likes to joke that I'm always on to the next shiny thing. And I was I, the editor I'm working with, her name is Bev. And I said to her today, I'm like, I just want this to be done because I want to start publicizing it. And she said, there is no next shiny thing until you make this book good. Like, I love it. Focus. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but I think my attention span at this point, I, I feel like I've exhausted my attention span with it, and so I need I need the kick in the pants to focus. Well, so. and just remember, finish strong. You got this, and then you can move on to like the fun, the fun stuff. The Thank you. And all the Thank you. The so good. Thank I love you. the shiny, the yeah. shiny thing. I have Squirrel. that. Pro I have that problem too, Gina. We get a lot of ideas in our heads, and they all sound great until we get to like putting them out on paper, and it's like, oh, yep. I got to write a book now. <laughs> Yeah. That's, and it's got to be more like, than five pages. Yeah. yeah. More than five pages. Exactly. I can do five, you know, we got to get like a hundred, 200 there. Yeah. So I get it. Yeah. Gina. So if our audience wanted to learn more about you or find out what you've got going on, kind of keep up with you on this project you're doing, where do we send them? So I, it's, I mean, it's, I think it's embarrassing. My marketing manager made me do it, but I do have ginashafer.com. Um, I am writing a blog. So today's blog post that went live was about the ESOP um, and, oh, you know, that? funny bloopers from the hardware store and stories about some of my teammates. Um, so uh, anything at GinaShaper.com for sure. And then AceHardwareDC.com is our company site that has lots of great information about the, our, the, our locations and what a co-op is, and some of the things that we sell online. So um, there's a couple ways I think people can find Wonderful. us. Wonderful. Perfect. We'll make sure when this goes out too, that we have those tagged to you so they know where to come find Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And what about yeah. social media? Are you, do you have a Gina Schaefer on social media account? Um, so I, I do on Facebook and LinkedIn as well. Um, those are the only two that I've, that I'm focused on. I keep thinking like I need to try. I don't know, Clubhouse. I don't know what all, all what you do, but you know, there's so many tick I thought, oh, TikTok videos with my husband and I, like bantering would be funny about business ownership or with my team. And then I thought That's Facebook. A lot of work. I don't know. I think she it's could a be lot fun though. I think Gina could probably be fun on TikTok. <laughs> I think there probably. could be some, there could I mean, be some fun clips in those ace hardware stories, you know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. We, we do yeah. go ahead, Gina. No, go ahead. I was just saying, I vision these videos where y'all like going through the parts and stuff. Like you can have all these videos on different parts. <laughs> what does this do? What does, what yeah, does this exactly. Do? They'd be hilarious. Yeah. You know, like I can yeah. just see it. For us dummies over here that don't know anything, they'd be really helpful. <laughs> David Letterman did a skit. It's probably been like eight years ago, maybe. You know how he does the top 10 or did the top 10? So he did a top 10 things you never want to hear in a hardware store. And it was, he filmed it in an ace and it was hysterical because- yeah, like I need to bury a dead body. Where's the shovel section? Or I mean, I don't even remember what else they were. But there's a lot of jokes that fly in the hardware store. Yeah, so <laughs> you should totally recreate that. That's great. <laughs> yeah. One day. All right. Well, Gina, this has been fun. Thank you so much for coming on here and sharing what you're doing, and we love it. And um, yeah, I, I just think it's awesome. Keep doing your thing. Great to connect. I with really you. appreciate We're it. Excited too. for you. If I can send anybody else your way or tell them about your book or more about your podcast, P please let me know how I can do that. We will do that. We will do that. Thank All right. you. Cool. All right. We do Thank want to you. say to our listeners, of course, if you enjoy our podcast, please be sure you give us a rating on both on iTunes and Facebook because we can't do this without you and head over to our YouTube page and click that subscribe button. And don't forget to pick up your free gift over at startergirls.com so we can keep in touch and help you uh, move forward in positive ways in your life and business. All right. Well, and Jennifer didn't bring her final thought, but I do have one with me today. So in order to have success, you must start. And every start begins with a decision. All right, you guys take care, be safe, and be kind to one another. We will see you next time.